Welcome to another episode of the True Crime Tales. Today's episode is called, The Murder of Lacey Peterson. It was May 4th, 1975, when Sharon and Dennis had a baby girl, they named Lacey Rocha. Lacey grew up and worked on a farm near Escalon, California, with her older brother Brent. She mostly enjoyed gardening with her mom. Her father ran a tractor rental business, but divorced her mother when Lacey was very young. Her mother eventually remarried, and her stepfather is a dairy farmer. As a girl, Lacey was always smiling and bubbly and talkative, usually the center of attention, said a childhood friend. She was a cheerleader in high school and majored in horticulture at California Polytechnic Institute in San Luis Obispo. Scott was born October 24, 1972, in San Diego, California. His father owned a crate packing company and his mother owned a boutique in La Jolla. They lived in a two-bedroom apartment in La Jolla. Scott began playing golf at an early age and was soon able to beat his father at the game. For a time, he had dreamed of becoming a professional golfer. While he was at the University of San Diego High School, he was teammates with future pro golfer Phil Mickelson. By the end of high school, he was one of the top junior golfers in San Diego. In 1990, he and Phil enrolled at Arizona State University on a partial golf scholarship. There, Scott was discouraged by the considerable competition that Mickelson and another unnamed future pro presented. According to Chip Couch, the father of another young golfer, Chris Couch, Scott was taken off the golf team after Chip discovered that Scott had taken his son out drinking while Chris was visiting Arizona State for a recruiting trip. Chip complained to the Arizona State golf coach, who subsequently kicked Scott off the team. Scott transferred to Cuesta College and then to California Polytechnic State University. Initially planning to major in international business, Scott ultimately graduated with a degree in agricultural business. Professors who taught Scott described him as a model student. His agribusiness professor, Jim Ahern, commented, I wouldn't mind having a class full of Scott Petersons. Lacey met Scott Peterson, a fellow student at Cal Poly, who worked as a waiter, when he took her order at a cafe. Lacey would occasionally visit the restaurant to see a friend who also worked there. Lacey asked that friend to give Scott her phone number. Lacey had told her mother that she had met the man that she would marry. Scott later called Lacey, and they began dating. As the relationship grew more serious, Scott put aside his dreams of professional golf to focus on a business career. The couple dated for two years and eventually moved in together. In 1997, after Lacey graduated, they married at Sycamore Mineral Springs Resort. While Scott finished his senior year, Lacey took a job in nearby Prundale. Prosecutors later stated that, around this time, Scott engaged in his first extramarital affair, though they did not reveal the details of the relationship. Scott graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree in agricultural business in June 1998, and the Petersons opened a sports bar in San Luis Obispo called The Shack. The Petersons decided to put the shack up for sale when they moved to Lacey's hometown of Modesto, California, to start a family. They completed the sale in April 2001 to return to their shared hometown of Modesto. Around that time, the Petersons purchased a three-bedroom, two-bath bungalow house for $177,000 on Cavina Avenue in an upscale neighborhood near East La Loma Park. 
Lacey took a part-time job as a substitute teacher, and Scott got a job with Trade Corp USA, a newly founded subsidiary of a European fertilizer company, for which he earned a salary of $5,000 a month before taxes. Lacey's family, including her mother and younger sister, related that she devoted much of her energy towards being the perfect housewife, and that she enjoyed cooking, entertaining and watching Martha Stewart. In 2002, Lacey discovered she was pregnant. Her due date was February 10, 2003. The couple had planned to name their son Connor. Scott Peterson had admitted to family members and friends that he cheated on his wife, Lacey Peterson, at least four times with different women. One relative, who does not believe Peterson is guilty of murder, described him as a sex addict. He has a sexual problem and has a need to sleep with other women, according to a relative. Scott Peterson's family has contended that his wife was aware of the affairs, and that although she would get angry, she'd eventually put them behind her. Peterson's mother has told relatives and friends that she knew her daughter-in-law was aware of at least one affair, and that she once saw the couple arguing over it. On November 20, 2002, Scott had a blind date and was introduced by a friend to Amber Fry, a Fresno massage therapist, and the two began a romantic relationship. Amber did not know that Scott was married at the time they started their relationship. Scott has told his family that his relationship with Fry was strictly a physical relationship. On December 23, 2002, at 5.45 p.m., Lacey and Scott went to the salon, the workplace of Lacey's sister Amy Rocha, where Amy cut Scott's hair, as she did each month. Scott offered to pick up a fruit basket that Amy had ordered because he would be playing golf the next day at a course near the retailer. Prosecutors say Scott also told other people he would play golf on the day of Christmas Eve. Lacey's mother, Sharon, spoke with Lacey on the telephone around 8.30 that evening. The last three people known to have spoken to Lacey before she disappeared were Amy, Sharon, and Scott. Scott later told police that he last saw his wife about 9.30 a.m. on December 24, when he left to go fishing at the Berkeley Marina. He said Lacey was watching a Martha Stewart show about meringue and preparing to mop the floor, bake cookies, and walk the family dog to a nearby park. Karen Servas, a neighbor of the Petersons, stated that she found the Petersons' dog, a golden retriever named Mackenzie, alone outside the home and returned him to the Peterson's backyard at around 10.30 a.m. She later testified that she had found the dog at 10.18. Another neighbor, Mike Chiavetta, said he saw Mackenzie at about 10.45 a.m. as he played catch with his own dog. The Modesto Bee also reported an unnamed female neighbor found the dog with a muddy leash, wandering in the neighborhood. That neighbor put the dog in the Peterson's yard, not observing that anything was out of place. At 2.15 p.m., Scott left a message for Lacey, stating, Hey, beautiful, it's 2.15. I'm leaving Berkeley showered and washed his clothes. A neighbor of Scott's later said that Scott had knocked on his door, asking if he had seen Lacey. The neighbor and his wife both testified overhearing Scott saying that he had been golfing that day and had tried to call Lacey. A relative of Lacey's would also later testify that, when friends and family began gathering at the Peterson home that night, Scott said he had gone to play golf. Scott called his mother-in-law, Sharon, to ask if Lacey was with her. Sharon subsequently said that call was when she learned Lacey was missing. 
Scott and Lacey's stepfather both reported Lacey missing. The police received the report of her disappearance shortly before 6 p.m. At the time of her disappearance, Lacey was seven and a half months pregnant, with a due date of February 10, 2003. A woman named Margarita Nava recalled cleaning the Peterson single-story home December 23, 2002, when she said Lacey appeared tired from spending the day shopping. However, Lacey had typically been the same way other times Nava had seen her. Scott allegedly told police he last saw Lacey around 9.30 a.m. on the day of her disappearance when she left the home to walk their dog. Scott then left home to go fishing in nearby Berkeley Marina. He returned later that day and said Lacey was nowhere to be found. Amy Rocha, Lacey's sister, testified during pretrial proceedings that Lacey thought the world of Scott. Lacey's mother reportedly said Scott called at 5.17 p.m. to say Lacey was missing. Modesto police detectives Alan Brocchini and John Bueller, the lead investigators on the case, responded to the missing person call. When they arrived at the Peterson home, Lacey's keys, wallet, and sunglasses were found in her purse in a closet. Bueller then stated, I suspected Scott when I first met him. Didn't mean he did it, but I was a little bit thrown off by his calm, cool demeanor, and his lack of questioning. He wasn't, will you call me back? Can I have one of your cards? What are you guys doing now? Bueller further described Scott's behavior as a strange combination of polite and arrogant disaffectedly distant and impatiently irritable. He just didn't seem like a man who was crushed or even greatly disturbed by his wife's disappearance and possible death. After Scott told the police that he had gone to fish for sturgeon at the Berkeley Marina, about 90 miles from the couple's Modesto home, detectives launched a search. The police later said they suspected foul play almost immediately. They did not treat the case as suspicious within the first few hours after the missing persons report was filed. During this period, Scott's in-laws defended him and portrayed him and Lacey as the ideal couple, and public perception of Scott reflected this. As police continued to investigate, they grew more suspicious of Scott. On January 17, 2003, it became known that Scott had engaged in two other extramarital affairs prior to an affair with a woman named Amber Fry. Fry informed police of their relationship on December 30, 2002, shortly after discovering he was a person of interest in Lacey's disappearance. She told detectives that she met Scott on November 20 and that he had initially told her he was single. She also informed police that on December 9, two weeks before Lacey's disappearance, Scott had told her that he was a widower, and it would be the first Christmas without his wife. Police considered whether this was an indication that Scott had already decided to kill Lacey. Fry agreed to phone him while police recorded her subsequent phone conversations with Scott in the hopes of getting him to confess. On January 15, 2003, police told Lacey's immediate family that Scott had been having an affair and showed Sharon and Ron a photo of Scott with Amber. Sharon indicated at this point that she believed Scott had killed Lacey. On January 24, Sharon, Ron and Lacey's brother, Brent, told reporters that they were withdrawing their support from Scott, though Scott had not officially been named as a suspect. Hours later, Amber Fry held a press conference, in which she explained her role in the investigation. Ron would later testify that they did this upon learning of his affair with Fry 
upon seeing photos of the two of them together. A month after Lacey's disappearance, her brother, Brett Rocha, stated at a press conference that Scott had admitted to him during a January 16, 2003, phone conversation that he had been having an affair with a woman from Fresno at the time, though Brent added that Scott was now no longer communicating with the Rocha family. Modesto police and firefighters carried out an extensive search along Dry Creek the day after Lacey's disappearance. The search came to include helicopters equipped with searchlights, police mounted on horseback and bicycles, canine units, and water rescue units on rafts. A total of 30 officers were involved in the search, as well as Lacey's loved ones and volunteers, who posted flyers to raise awareness of her disappearance. At a press conference, Detective Al Brocchini said that police did not believe that Lacey decided to leave without contacting her family, commenting, that is completely out of character for her. The initial search and later vigil were organized by Lacey's immediate family and friends. In the first two days, up to 900 people were involved in looking for Lacey before community officials or police directly participated in the search, and prior to significant media coverage. Eventually, the story attracted nationwide media interest. A $25,000 reward was offered, later increased to $250,000 and, finally, to $500,000, for any information leading to Lacey's safe return. Posters, blue and yellow ribbons, and flyers were circulated, and the original, basic version of the Lacey Peterson website was launched by the husband of one of her friends. Friends, family, and volunteers set up a command center at a nearby Red Lion Hotel to record developments and circulate information. Over 1,500 volunteers signed up to distribute information and to help search for her. On April 13, 2003, a couple walking their dog found the decomposing body of a full-term male infant in a marshy area of the San Francisco Bay Shore in Richmond's Point Isabel Regional Shoreline Park. An April 24 ABC News report stated his umbilical cord was still attached, and the San Francisco Chronicle reported that it appeared torn, rather than cut or clamped, as is the normal practice following birth. However, ABC News later reported on May 30 that, according to the autopsy, neither the umbilical cord nor the placenta was found with the body. One day later, a passerby found the body of a recently pregnant woman washed up on the eastern, rocky shoreline of the bay, one mile away from where the baby's body was found. The corpse was decomposed to the point of being almost unrecognizable as a human body. The body was missing the head and arms, and most of the legs. On April 18, 2003, the results of DNA tests verified that they were the bodies of Lacey and her unborn son. The autopsies on both bodies were performed by forensic pathologist. The fetus's skin was not decomposed at all, though the right side of his body was mutilated. Although a judge sealed the autopsy results, an anonymous Associated Press source revealed that 1.5 loops of nylon tape were found around the fetus's neck and a significant cut was on the fetus's body. The exact date and cause of Lacey's death were never determined. Her cervix was intact. She had suffered two cracked ribs, but the pathologist could not determine if this occurred before or after her death. Lacey's upper torso had been emptied of internal organs except for the uterus, which protected the fetus, explaining the lower level of decomposition he experienced. 
The pathologist concluded that the fetus had died in the womb and determined he had been expelled from Lacey's decaying body, though when cross-examined in court, he conceded that he could not determine whether he had been born alive when this occurred. The pathologist also found meconium in Connor's bowels, which is the first stool passed after birth. After Lacey's and Connor's remains were located, police reportedly kept quiet out of a concern that Scott might flee. Police ultimately arrested Peterson just days later. Investigators pulled over Peterson's car roughly 30 miles from Mexico and discovered he was carrying $15,000 cash and his brother's passport, had grown a goatee, and had dyed his hair. He was charged with capital murder for Lacey's and Connor's deaths and pleaded not guilty. Investigators later said Peterson had converted the baby's nursery into a storage room, sold Lacey's car and looked into selling their Modesto home in the weeks after she disappeared. They argued that Peterson had dumped the victim's bodies in the San Francisco Bay from his fishing boat. The FBI and Modesto Police Department performed forensic searches of the Peterson home. The FBI also conducted mitochondrial DNA testing on a hair from pliers found in Scott's fishing boat that linked them with hairs recovered from Lacey's hairbrush. The authorities also searched Scott's pickup truck, toolbox, warehouse, and boat. A homemade anchor was found in the boat that Scott had purchased two weeks earlier. Scott told a detective that he made the anchor for the boat using a 90-pound bag of concrete and used the rest of the bag to repair his driveway. The detective testified that he found a cement-like substance on the wooden bed of a boat trailer when he searched Scott's warehouse on December 27th. The detective pointed to what he said were five circular areas on the trailer that had less powder residue than other areas on the trailer. He also found a dustpan surrounded by the white powder and a sledgehammer. Prosecutors believed that Scott made five anchors and used four of them to sink Lacey's body in San Francisco Bay. After Scott was arrested, police conducted further searches in the bay to locate the anchors, but nothing was found. Scott was arrested on April 18, 2003, near a La Jolla golf course, where he said he was meeting his father and brother for a game of golf. His naturally dark brown hair had been dyed blonde, and his Mercedes was overstuffed with miscellaneous items including nearly 15,000 U.S. dollars in cash, 12 Viagra tablets, survival gear, camping equipment, several changes of clothes, four cell phones, and two driver's licenses, his and his brother's. Scott's father, Lee Peterson, explained that Scott had used his brother's license the day before to get a San Diego resident discount at the golf course and that Scott had been living out of his car because of the media attention. Police and prosecutors, however, saw these items as an indication that Scott had planned to flee to Mexico. On April 21, 2003, Scott was arraigned in Stanislaus County Superior Court before Judge Nancy Ashley. He was charged with two felony counts of murder with premeditation and special circumstances. He pleaded not guilty. Judge Algy Rolami of Stanislaus County Superior Court moved his trial to San Mateo County because of the concern so many people in Stanislaus had made up their minds about Scott's guilt. Before his arraignment, Peterson had been represented by Kirk McAllister, a veteran criminal defense attorney from Modesto. Chief Deputy Public Defender Kent Faulkner was also assigned to the case. Peterson later indicated that he could afford a private attorney, namely Mark Garagos, 
who had done other high-profile criminal defense work. Scott's trial began on June 1, 2004, and was followed closely by the news media. The lead prosecutor was Rick DeStaso, while Garagos led Scott's defense. Lacking direct evidence to link Scott to the crime, prosecutors chiefly relied on circumstantial evidence, pointing to Scott's behavior before and after Lacey's disappearance. Through various witnesses, the prosecution suggested Scott had several motives for killing Lacey, that he was tired of his marriage, that he felt pressure from her pregnancy, that he wanted to continue his affair with Fry, and that he was under mounting financial pressure. Prosecutors claimed Scott made cement anchors to weigh his wife's body down in San Francisco Bay. The prosecution witness said that neither of two hair follicles found on Scott's boat belonged to Scott, though he said he could not determine whether they belonged to Lacey. An FBI trace evidence expert said she matched one of the hairs to a hair found in Lacey's hairbrush through mitochondrial DNA tests. The prosecution further suggested that the hair must have come from Lacey's dead body because she had not seen the boat while alive. Defense lawyers argued that mitochondrial testing was not a reliable means of DNA comparison, only half of the states in the U.S. allowed the practice, and further contended that Lacey had, in fact, been on the boat while alive. A witness reported that she had seen Lacey at the warehouse with the boat the day before she was reported missing. On the stand, the detective explained that he had excised that witness's statement from his police report. Scott's defense lawyers based their case on the lack of direct evidence and played down the significance of circumstantial evidence. They also questioned whether the investigation was thorough, since Modesto police detective admitted he did not check the alibi of a prostitute who was accused of stealing checks from Scott's mailbox, and did not indicate that the woman was ever a suspect, and the prosecutor noted that the checks were stolen after Lacey vanished, precluding the woman from involvement in her disappearance. A police community service officer testified that the playback of an interview with Scott had no sound because no batteries had been placed in the tape recorder that was used to record it. Other detectives were called to testify about the extensive search for evidence. On November 12, 2004, the jury convicted Scott of two counts of murder first-degree murder with special circumstances for killing Lacey, and second-degree murder for killing the fetus she carried, Connor. The penalty phase of the trial began on November 30th and concluded December 13th when the jury rendered a sentence of death. On March 16th, the judge followed the jury's verdict sentencing Scott to death by lethal injection and ordering him to pay $10,000 toward the cost of Lacey's funeral, calling the murder of Lacey cruel, uncaring, heartless, and callous. On October 21, 2005, a judge ruled that proceeds from a $250,000 life insurance policy Scott took out on Lacey would go to Lacey's mother which was reaffirmed by the 5th District Court of Appeal on October 31, 2007. Scott has maintained his innocence and continues to fight his murder conviction. His attorneys have claimed that he did not have a fair trial and have long attempted to secure a retrial for their client. They claim that a juror lied on her juror questionnaire and committed prejudicial misconduct by not disclosing that she had filed for a restraining order against her boyfriend's ex-girlfriend four years before the Peterson trial. She also wrote seven letters to Scott and co-authored a book with the other jurors. 
Scott's lawyers have also brought up new evidence that contradicts the prosecution's timeline of the morning Lacey disappeared, including that of the Peterson's mail carrier, whose testimony suggests that Lacey was alive for longer than previously thought. His attorneys also claim that neighbors saw Lacey alive after Scott left the house that day. In 2020, the California Supreme Court overturned his death penalty sentence and ordered a new sentencing trial for him. The court did not overturn his conviction. Peterson contends his trial was flawed for multiple reasons, beginning with the unusual amount of pretrial publicity that surrounded the case, the court said in its ruling. We reject Peterson's claim that he received an unfair trial as to guilt and thus affirm his convictions for murder. The ruling also noted that the original judge made a series of clear and significant errors in jury selection that, under long-standing United States Supreme Court precedent, undermined Peterson's right to an impartial jury at the penalty phase. Later that year, the California Supreme Court ruled that Scott's case should have an additional review to determine whether he was entitled to a second trial, wherein he could possibly be exonerated and freed from prison. In December 2022, a judge denied Scott's request for a new trial. In her decision, she wrote that the juror's misconduct was accidental. The court concludes that juror number seven's responses were not motivated by pre-existing or improper bias against petitioner, Peterson, she wrote, but instead were a combination of good faith misunderstanding of the questions and sloppiness in answering. On January 19, 2024, the LA Innocence Project announced they were investigating Scott's case and said new evidence supports the claim that he did not kill Lacey and their unborn son. New evidence now supports Mr. Peterson's long-standing claim of innocence and raises many questions into who abducted and killed Lacey and Connor Peterson. That evidence includes updated witness statements that point to multiple areas of interest, particularly a December 2002 burglary of a home across the street from the Peterson's Modesto residence. Scott's attorneys have argued that Lacey was killed after witnessing men breaking into her neighbor's home. The organization also hopes to conduct new DNA testing on a blood-stained mattress found on December 25, 2002, nearby, which could link Lacey back to the burglars. Scott's defense attorney told People Magazine of the News, We are very excited to have the incredible attorneys at the LA Innocence Project lend their considerable expertise to helping prove Scott Peters' innocence. Stay tuned again next week for another episode of the True Crime Tales. Be safe and see you again next time.